So we're going to start off unit four by going into what DNA is and what it looks like, what it's used for, and what are some of the changes it can experience spontaneously. So why do we care? DNA is basically a four letter alphabet that's going to write all of the things that make us us. So it's going to have influence over what we look like, how we feel, and how we are personality wise, as well as important things like disease risk, like breast cancer, for example. So when we're looking at DNA, we're looking at something that all living organisms contain. So pretty much every cell inside of your body, with very few exceptions, are going to have DNA. And it's going to be containing all the instructions we need for all the functions of every enzyme and cell inside of our bodies. It's basically the blueprints, the instructions for everything that your cell has to accomplish. And DNA is a shorthand term that stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. If you're familiar with the term deoxyribonucleic acid, or if you remember what we learned in unit two, you notice that nucleic acid is in the name. That tells us it's part of the nucleic acid macromolecule category, and that the subunit or the monomer is the nucleotide. So let's look at DNA's structure and break down what the nucleotide is again, and talk about those four base pairs we have. Our basic nucleotide consists of three parts, the sugar, the phosphate, and a nitrogen containing base. And there are four possible bases that we can have. Adenine shown with an A, thymine shown with a T, guanine shown with a G, and cytosine shown with a C. When we look at the structure of the DNA itself, we see that the sugar and the phosphate form these ribbon-like backbones, and that the bases are found sandwiched in the middle. So if we look at the structure, we see that the adenine and the thymine are here forming the middle rung, and cytosine and guanine are also forming the next middle rung. When we look at these two pairs, we can use this as a template since adenine will always pair with thymine and guanine will always pair with cytosine. We call this complementary base pairing. So every single nucleotide is gonna have a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogen containing base, also called a nitrogenous base, with a 3D structure called a double helix, which looks like a twisted ladder. The phosphate and the sugars form the backbone and the bases form the rungs or the steps of that ladder in the center. If we look back on the previous um, slide, we saw that there were dotted lines connecting the bases together. Those dotted lines are hydrogen bonds. Now remember hydrogen bonds are relatively weak and they form when hydrogen and oxygen or hydrogen and nitrogen are attracted to each other. So these bases are complementary, meaning they're only gonna fit with one other base. So because they're complementary and they're only going to pair with one other base, we can 100% accurately predict which base is gonna be on the other side based on the base we see on the one side. So if we're looking at adenine, adenine will always pair with thymine and vice versa. Thymine will always pair with adenine. Cytosine will always pair with guanine and vice versa for that as well. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. So because of this, we know that if we have 100 ba uh, bases of adenine, we're going to have 100 thymine bases. If we have 50 cytosines, we're gonna have 50 guanines. And if we only have one of the two strands forming DNA, we know exactly what the other strand is going to be. Now, 50 or 100 bases does sound like a lot. However, if we look at a human DNA molecule, we're looking at about 200 million base pairs. So when we're looking at these molecules, these guys are massive. All of the DNA together is going to form what we call the genome. So the complete set of DNA. We find this in the nucleus when we're looking at things like animals and plants. And that genome can be broken down into segments or sections called chromosomes. These are one or more unique pieces of DNA and they can vary in length. So some can be longer and others can be shorter. They can be hundreds of millions of base pairs long, and they're gonna take a particular shape depending on which organism you are. If you're bacteria and prokaryotic, then you have circular chromosomes. If you're a eukaryotic cell, like an animal or plant cell, your chromosomes are linear. In humans, we have 23 unique chromosomes, 
and we have two copies of each 23. So we have a total of 46. You get one copy of those 23 from your mom and you get your second copy of those 23 from your dad. On those chromosomes, we have specific segments called genes. These are about 3,000 base pairs long, and each gene is gonna code for a very specific protein. So genes can come in different versions or varieties called alleles. The gene is for that particular trait, and the alleles is different versions of that trait. So let's think of it in a recipe sense. Consider this. There's a gene that codes for chicken enchiladas, if we're using recipes as our example. You can have different versions of chicken enchilada recipes. Some might be spicier recipes, others might be milder. Maybe one recipe calls for a red sauce, another calls for a green sauce. All in all, all of those recipes are for the same dish, chicken enchiladas. There's just small variations that lead to a slightly different outcome in the end. So let's look at it from this perspective. We have these different flowers. We have an orange flower, a yellow flower, and a purple flower. And if we look at the gene for flower color, we see that there are different versions of that same gene. In this one, we have an allele for orange petals. In this one, allele two is for yellow petals and allele three is for purple petals. It's the same type of gene, petal color, but different versions that give us the different colors we see. So the sequence of DNA bases is the genetic code that gives us all the instructions to build the different polypeptides and proteins that make up our cells and our whole bodies. And it's the entire set of DNA that we call the genome. We organize this genome in the form of chromosomes, and that's mainly how we're looking at it when we look at the eukaryotic DNA, so in animal, plant, fungus, and protist cells. And we have certain sections of DNA that code for something called genes. And we can find these genes in very specific regions. We call that location or region the locus. Now, from one person to the next, if we're looking for a particular gene, we're gonna find it in the same spot in person A that we find it in person B. That makes it easy for us to learn about what different genes are and what they do, since we have a very specific pattern and location that we can find them in. Each gene contains specialized instructions to produce one specific protein that we can further process. So we're basically making the raw materials that a cell needs to do all of the daily tasks it completes. An allele is just a version of that DNA sequence of a gene. So if the gene codes for a certain trait, the allele is going to be the version of that trait. And genes can have one, two, seven, ten, a hundred different alleles within a population. However, when we're looking at humans, an individual person will only have two alleles, since they have two copies of each chromosome. When we have those two copies and they interact together to form the outward appearance, we call that the trait, the physical expression of the allele. Now, all humans with the correct 46 chromosomes have all the same genes in all the same places. We just have slightly different versions. We have different alleles for those genes. And it's the different combination of alleles that gives us the differences in how tall we are, what color our skin is, what color our eyes are, and other personality traits that might lead us to be maybe easier going or more high strung. Now it's important to note that how much DNA you have does not relate to how complex you are as an organism. Some organisms are very complicated and have very small genomes, and others are seemingly simple with massive strands of DNA. And not all DNA found in the nucleus actually is part of a gene. There's a good amount of it, depending on the organism, that doesn't seem to code for anything. In fact, in humans, only about 2% of our DNA actually produces a protein. So let's look at a few genome sizes in different organisms. If we look at the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, the genome size is about 180 million base pairs long. Compare that to a human, we have about 3,400 million base pairs. And going down this list, we notice the amoeba, something seemingly simple and small, 
that has over 600,000 million base pairs. It's massive and yet seemingly really, really simplified compared to an organism like ourselves. And then we look at how much of the DNA we have that actually codes for something. With humans, only 2% of our DNA actually codes for a protein versus the roundworm where a quarter, 25% of their DNA codes for proteins, and E. coli, a bacteria where 90% 9 out of 10 base pairs are involved in coding for a protein. So it's wildly different in how DNA is being utilized within a genome.